It's a devastating lifelong disease, making rapid and correct diagnosis critical. 50% of infants will not survive within the first six months of life due to calcification and narrowing of their arteries. And worldwide, there are only a handful of adult survivors. We traveled to Manchester, England to meet Dr. Mogul, who specializes in this condition. But first, we're gonna meet one family who experienced the impact of this disease. Let's go behind the mystery of ENPP1 deficiency. I was expecting twins, and when I was 37 weeks pregnant, I was induced. Adrian was born first. I couldn't hear him crying, and that's the first thing you listen for when you have a baby. Janine was born and she cried straight away. They x-rayed uh, Adrian, and really his, his, his whole body was dotted with um, calcium on the x-rays. Janine had it in her pulmonary arteries and her aorta, but not as dense in smaller amounts. Adrian passed away after his third heart attack at six weeks. It was time for us to come home with Janine. And at that time, we thought we were coming home to the same thing. We thought we were coming home to the same thing going to happen to Janine. Nothing had happened to her, which, uh, thank goodness, it, it, it didn't. When Janine was two years old, doctors tested tissue samples of the family, which determined she had generalized arterial calcification of infancy. Despite having the name of the disease, little was known about how it would affect Janine's future. Very few doctors knew anything about it, and we just felt so alone. There wasn't, there was nothing uplifting there was one or two survivors. In a nutshell, it's getting the information out there and educating doctors and the medical profession that, you know, early treatment can help and can make things better. I mean, if I could have been treated in utero with Adrian, you might still be here today. The Balancing Act met with Dr. Mogul of the Royal Manchester Children's Hospital to learn more. ENPP1 deficiency is a genetic disorder which is caused by mutation in the ENPP1 gene. It leads to a deficiency of inorganic pyrophosphate. If you have low levels in the body, you start getting calcification in the wrong places. And one important area is in the blood vessels, which can progress to blockage of the blood vessels. It leads to a condition known as generalized arterial calcification of infancy, which is usually abbreviated to GACI. And as the disease progresses, organs such as the heart and the brain are deprived of important nutrients like glucose and oxygen. You start getting equivalent of heart attack occurring in a young infant, strokes and death. There is no cure or approved treatment for Gacy, but there are ways to manage the calcium buildup, which is why it's important to recognize it as soon as possible, starting while the baby is still in utero. Ultrasound scan may reveal excessive amount of fluid surrounding the baby in the womb, excessive amount of fluid in the pericardium or the covering of the heart, and finally it may show bright echoes coming from calcium deposits within the blood vessels. If the diagnosis is not made before birth, it is very important to include GACI or GACI in the differential diagnosis of an infant who presents with symptoms and signs of heart failure. Symptoms of heart failure include feeding difficulties, rapid breathing, lips turning blue, and cardiogenic shock. A pediatric cardiologist should be brought in to evaluate these infants and perform an EKG and high-resolution CT scan of the heart. Finally, a full-body CT scan should be performed to look for further calcification. And finally, it is vitally important to confirm the diagnosis by looking for mutations in the two genes which cause these conditions, namely ENPP1 and ABCC6 genes. GACI is a multi-system disorder and uh, its manifestations are different during infancy, uh, childhood, 
adolescence and adulthood. Infants who survive can go on to develop autosomal recessive hypophosphatemic rickets type 2. So these infants start losing phosphate in their urine and their blood phosphate starts to drop. The bones become soft, in other words they develop rickets, either bored legs or knock knees, short stature, bone pain and fatigue. So if the rickets is diagnosed early, it can be treated promptly, thereby avoiding limb deformities. Other manifestations of ARHR2 include fused vertebrae of the neck, calcific enthesopathy, retinal problems, hearing loss, dental problems, joint stiffness, high blood pressure, and residual effects of organ damage from infancy. So genetic testing is critical because there are children, adolescents, and adults with hypophosphatemic rickets or osteomalacia in whom the accurate diagnosis has not been made. Stay with us. We're going to meet Janine when we come back. Welcome back. It's estimated that there are between 11 and 12,000 individuals worldwide with ENPP1 deficiency. Symptoms can vary greatly in different patients and siblings with the same genetic mutation can have very different outcomes. Here's Janine's story. Once I got diagnosed with rickets, I started to see Dr. Magalu, who's an endocrinologist. So the rickets were treated with a phosphate and alpha-calcidol, and that improved the bone density in my bones and got rid of some of the misalignment of my bones, which allowed me to carry on doing the dancing. Went for an x-ray and they realized that I had a fused cervical spine, be extremely painful, uh, limits range of movement, and can cause a lot of nerve pain. I also started to have a lot of bone pain in my ankles and it was diagnosed as something called calcific enthesopathies and it becomes painful and reduces range of movement considerably. I didn't know what I was experiencing was connected to something bigger, but there wasn't enough research out there and enough patients out there to kind of make that connection. So the better way to describe my condition was an EMPP1 gene deficiency, which started as GACI and then started to manifest as a ARHR2, the rickets side. So the doctors need to be aware that survivors of uh, GACI are going to go on to develop ARHR2, and they need to be proactive in monitoring urinary phosphate wastage and um, blood phosphate levels. So there is no approved treatment for ENPP1 deficiency. So the treatment really involves dealing with symptoms as and when they arise. There's ongoing research into the condition which involves developing targeted therapy, more specifically in ENPP1 replacement therapy and phase one trials will be starting in the near future. It was helpful to know more about my condition and all the connections, but it was frustrating that there was no effective treatment available to me. The doctors weren't sure how my condition would progress because I'm one of the oldest patients with this condition. And I also started to realise how lucky I was really compared to some of the other patients with this condition. So this is an ultra-rare medical disorder and therefore Physician education is very important to make them aware of this condition and upcoming exciting treatments that will be available. It is very important that patients and parents advocate for themselves and seek out expert help if that is not available locally. So my day-to-day -day life at the moment, uh, I'm in quite a bit of pain. I uh, take a lot of medications to both deal with the pain and also to try and deal with the rickets. Um, I work full time, but if I don't get any effective treatment and my condition doesn't improve, I'll probably have to start reducing those hours. Um, I'm aware that it affects my quality of life all the time. I feel very fatigued. Uh, I see lots of different doctors and at the moment there's still no effective treatment for myself. My hope for this condition is that it'll improve not only survival, but also the quality of life for patients with this condition. There is hope, and yes, it's a difficult road, but it will get better, and effective treatment will be available, I'm sure of it. For more information, visit gakiglobal.org. That's G-A-C-I global.org, or you can visit our website, thebalancingact.com.